Hello, I'm Dwight Reichel. I'm a technical consultant to the Petroleum Technology Transfer Council, who is co-sponsor with Steve Melzer in the APTA for this interview series. We initiated this series to spread the word to industry and the public of the potential new oil supply and CO2 storage potential of the residual oil zone. Our guest in this session is Velo Krushkra, founder, president, and chairman of the board of Advanced Resources International, a broad energy consultancy based in Houston and Washington, D.C. For more information on Velo and Advanced Resources, see their website. Among the studies Advanced Resources participated in is the research to identify and quantify the potential of the ROZ. Velo will answer all your questions. Well, thank you, Dwight. And this is the second interview of the Residual Oil Zone interviews. And I'm here with Vela Kuskra. You want to tell us about your, your presentation here? Yes. I'm going to talk about the recovery of oil from the residual oil zone. And in the previous interview, Steve Melzer has really laid down a sound basis for the origin and the presence of residual oil zones below existing oil fields as well as in the areas outside of oil fields that are called fairways. And my task today is to talk about how much oil we might be able to get out of these residual oil zones below existing fields, but also talk a little bit about the size of the potential in the fairways, the fairways of the residual oil zone. At the bottom of the slide are the references. Okay, so how is an oil field with below main pay zone ROZs identified? Interestingly, we actually go back to the early work by King Hubbard, uh, who began to look at the hydrodynamics that governed oil migration. Berg added on to that by recognizing that hydrodynamics can create tilted uh, oil water contacts. And that was our first approach for identifying prospective fields that could have residual oil zones. Then we took the next step and we began to assemble logs and other data which would confirm that a residual oil zone existed below these oil fields. And then as a final step, we populated the data on the residual oil zone using information from our big oil fields reservoir database. Can you give us an example of an oil field that has been identified to have a tilted oil water contact? Yes, a classic one is the Seminole oil field. And what we see is a, a gradient of about 20 feet uh, that exists from one edge of the field to the other edge of the field and the continuation of that tilt across the field. And that's just an example of one of the major fields in the Central Basin platform, Means and Shafter Lake are other fields that have those kinds of uh, tilted water oil contacts. So I understand you've done some research on the Williston Basin. You want to give us a little bit of information about that? Sure. We wanted to see if similar kinds of residual oil zones might exist in other places. And so we went up to the Williston Basin and again looked for oil fields that had these tilted oil water contacts. And we came across a number of them. Two, for example, would be the Big Stick oil field and the Alcorn Ranch oil field. Um, and uh, we found that uh, a number of others existed in this particular area. Can you tell us about some of the key ROZ properties? Sure, we're very fortunate that industry has put out some information on the reservoir properties of the residual oil zone. For example, Hess has a wonderful article on the characterization of the Seminole oil field. Um, and what we find is that the properties in the residual oil zone are very similar to the reservoir properties in the main pay zone, particularly for permeability and porosity, and often are actually better. What differentiates the residual oil zone from the main pay zone, of course, is 
the, the starting level of oil saturation is lower, might be around 30% or so, but it makes up for it by often being much thicker. In addition, a number of the other companies, for example, for Salt Creek, uh, Exxon put out a wonderful log that showed the distribution of the thickness of the residual oil zone and it, its extent throughout the column. So you have some example data on some of the fields throughout the Permian Basin? Yes, we go now back to the Permian Basin. We carved the basin up into five major areas. Uh, we start with something like the northern shelf of the basin, and there we found 12 fields, uh, big fields like Wasson, Slaughter, Leveland, and so on. Then we went to the central basin platform we just talked about. We found six fields, you know, Seminole, Mean, Shafter Lake, and a number of others. Uh, then we went to the southern part of the Central Basin Platform, and this was a rich area. There were 16 fields, big fields like McElroy, Cowden, Goldsmith, and so on. Uh, then the Horseshoe Atoll, the Canyon Reef type of reservoirs were the Kelly Snyder, or people know it as the Sackrock Field, and Salt Creek, and Cogdo. And then finally, it also we found the residual oils over in the uh, New Mexico part of the Permian Basin in vacuum and hobs and other fields like that. So overall, we ended up with 55 fields that we could, had tilted water oil contacts and we could confirm with other data the presence of residual oil. And roughly 30 billion barrels of remaining oil in place in these 55 oil fields. At the bottom of the slide, there are some additional references that provide that would provide useful information for the reader. Okay, so I noticed that the first field on your list here was Wasson Bennett. Uh, you have some data to show us over that? I do. It takes some work to pull out the data on the residual oil zone because it isn't often provided directly in the literature. So you have to kind of put together and do a little uh, investigation. Um, what we see is that the uh, irregular uh, flood in the main pay zone started in, in basically the Bennett Ranch Field in 1985. And it had a nice kick in terms of oil production. And then in basically at the beginning of 2004, uh, the, the flood was extended down into the residual oil zone. And you can see from the slide the nice additional jump in oil production. And we've carried that data forward through basically the middle of 2013. And instead of having a field that's in decline, now you have a field that's basically maintaining a level of production far above what it would have gotten either from the continuation of water flood or just the CO2 flood in the main pay zone. So do you have another example of increased production due to the ROZ? Sure, a another a field would be Salt Creek. I had shown a log on the Salt Creek field earlier, and this is an older uh, residual oil zone uh, project. Uh, operated by ExxonMobil. It started back in 2000 and they've added on to that. And again, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a reference to this particular project. So you want to tell us about some of the simulations between the CO2 ROZ flooding? Yes, we took the information on reservoir properties and whatever we could glean from the actual performance of residual oil zone floods and begin to put that information first into a full-scale reservoir simulator, GEM, uh, which is a finite difference compositional simulator, and then second, put that information into a more simplistic a stream tube model. It still is a, a finite difference model, uh, but it runs a lot quicker. And we, were, we found that we could actually uh, replicate this much more sophisticated analysis with the stream tube model. We did that then, took that information and applied CO2 profit to 
the 55 fields in the Permian Basin to begin to look at how much oil we might be able to recover at what kind of CO2 requirements over what period of time. Would you tell us about the match that was obtained between the CO2 profit and Jim? Yes. Um, we did this as an example for four fields, and two of them are shown on this particular slide, the Watson Denver unit and the Seminole San Andreas unit. And what you see in the dark line is the oil recovery uh, projection over time from the full-scale compositional finite difference reservoir simulator. At the lower side in the dashed line was our first attempt to match uh, uh, using profit and the same reservoir properties, and we found we were actually slightly pessimistic. Uh, what we needed to do was to slightly boost the level of the oil saturation um, in profit, and then with that, then you see that middle line, which is in red, and you see actually quite a good match between profit and reservoir simulator, even though we might still be a, a little bit conservative. So what else did you learn with that comparison? We actually found some really interesting insights. And one of them was that if you conducted the uh, main pay zone and the residual oil zone CO2 flood at the same time, you had better performance. You wouldn't, as opposed to running the main pay zone first and then coming back years later into the residual oil zone. The CO2 oil ratios were much better if you run them jointly. Uh, and as I show in the slide, typically around 13 MCF per barrel, uh, all gross injection, compared to 16 MCF of CO2 per barrel uh, if you're running this, them separately. And the reason for that is if you're running them separately and you're doing the residual oil zone after you've done the main pay zone, you have a tendency to lose that CO2 up into the main pay zone. And we actually saw that in some of the early residual oil zone projects. Now, running them jointly isn't always possible because like at Wasson and elsewhere, you've had an existing flood, but there are many, many fields uh, in the Permian Basin that still have not been flooded in their main pay zone. So if there's one message I could give to the audience, it'd be, do them together. You'll get the oil quicker and you'll be more efficient. So what do you predict that the recoverable ROZ below the main pay zone will be? We did that. We talked a little bit about the work we did in the Permian Basin for the 55 fields and we applied a similar approach using profit and the reservoir properties to the Bighorn Basin that were 13 fields there and the 20 fields that we identified in the Williston Basin. If you add all that together, you have a really uh, impressive resource base to go after, 42 billion barrels. And our reservoir modeling shows that you can technically recover 16 billion barrels from these 88 fields. Um, most of that's in the Permian Basin, but both the Bighorn and the Williston Basin have some nice contributions. Now, it'll take a lot of CO2. Our estimate is that it'll take about seven uh, billion metric tons of CO2 to achieve this technical potential. Now, we haven't looked at the economic potential yet, but we would expect it to be very similar to the main pay zone. Uh, because after all, we're starting with similar oil saturations in the residual oil zone after industry has water flooded the main pay zone. And if we look at the uh, potential economic potential of the San Andreas fields in the Permian Basin, we see that about two thirds of the resource would be economically viable at roughly 90 to $100 oil. So as a first guess, potentially about two thirds of this 16 billion barrels would be economic at $50.
pretty much today's oil prices. Could you tell us about the uh, Permian Basin's ROZ Fairway? I'm going to start with this wonderful work that Steve Melzer has done on mapping the residual oil fairways, and there are a number of them in the Permian Basin. Um, and so what I did was to take the outlines of these 55 fields in the Permian Basin and lay them into these fairways. And what I discovered there was the fairway is about three, at least three times bigger in terms of aerial extent than the area covered by these individual oil fields. So while we had the work to really quantify the size of the fairways is still to be done, a good first guess might be we're dealing with something in terms of oil in place on the order of 100 billion barrels. And so you add that resource to the residual oil zone below existing fields and you really have a major target to go after. So that sounds like a lot of work in the future. I'm so glad you took some time to come and be with us and tell us about this, Velo. And I'm glad that you guys all watched this. We're gonna have some links down in the description so that you can get some of these resources. And don't forget to like us and share us so we can keep on making residual oil zone interviews. Oh.